Have you ever wondered how correlations can be used to make it seem like something's related when they're not related at all? Or maybe just incidentally related? That's what we'll talk about today. One of the first things taught in introductory statistic textbooks is that correlation is not causation. It is also one of the first things forgotten. Thomas Sowell, economist. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about more statistical mistakes or ways that people play with statistics in order to either fool people or convince them of something that is not true or may not be true. Remember the old toothpaste ad? 80% of dentists recommend Colgate. Well, what they didn't tell you in that particular study is they went through and gave dentists the list of a lot of toothpastes, Crests, all the other brands. And they said, just check which ones you would recommend to people. 80% of the dentists did check the box on Colgate. We don't know if 90% checked it on Crest. Only part of the statistic was held out from you so that you could see the answer they wanted to say. So it's a trick, looked like what they wanted it to say, but it wasn't exactly an ethical way to use the statistics they were catching. One situation we get into is the problem when we talk about percentages. People will talk a lot of times about scary percentage statistics. They may say something like, the rate of cancer next to this power pole increased 200%. What was the rate before? We can't look at a percentage unless we know exactly what the increase was. Was there one case of cancer and now there are three cases of cancer? That's a huge increase when we're talking about percentages. But it may not mean anything at all unless we know exactly what number we're talking about. Another thing we should watch out for is called the Simpson fallacy, which of course is named after the TV show The Simpsons. There was one particular episode where a team that was going to patrol and get rid of bears in Springfield. But did they have a bear problem? Were there actually bears in there? And so Lisa tries to explain to Homer that she has this rock. And because of this rock, there are no tigers in Springfield. And Homer's like, wow, I will give you money for that rock. Well, there never was a tiger problem in Springfield. And just because she has a rock, and says that's why it's preventing tigers, or if there's a bear patrol and they say that's why there aren't bears, keep in mind that it may have nothing to do with each other. There's no reason to think that the cause and effect is there just because someone says that. Now let's talk about correlation. Correlation's an interesting thing, and you see it all the time. And they're almost always lies, I hate to say. For example, 100% of people who eat carrots die. Does that mean carrots cause death? Or the fact that they find out that more people drown on days where people buy more ice cream at the beach. That's where we call a confounding condition because it's actually just hot. And so more people are buying ice cream and more people are at the beach. So they're related, but not causational. So you can't say exactly what it is. There's a whole website that's in my show notes and you can run your own correlation. So for example, I decided to give it a whirl, and I found out that the number of people who were electrocuted by power lines correlates with the number of marriages in Alabama. Is everyone ready to go tell the press? When people will give statistics, you have to ask the question, are they related? Are they totally not related? Just because they're correlated, just because they have a relationship with each other, doesn't mean one causes the other. Back when I was a kid, they were talking about how people who ate oat muffins had less cancer, less health issues, the power of the oat muffin. And it turned out it was because, first of all, at that time, oat muffins were harder to find. And so the people who went out to find them tended to shop at health food grocery stores. So that also meant that they ate more vegetables, they ate more fruit, they probably watched their weight more. And the muffins tended to be expensive because someone who is wealthier, maybe has better access to health care, was one possible cause of the oat muffin effect. It's important to remember that correlation never predicts causation. It may be the same cause, but there's no reason 
because of that statistic that they are causational. And sometimes standards change too. I noticed that they had changed the definition in the United States for inflation. And so what used to be inflation is no longer the same definition of it. So we can't even compare inflation today versus inflation in the past because it's no longer apples to apples. So we're going to talk a little bit about how people use charts in order to either lie about statistics or mislead, again, either intentionally or harmfully, or they just don't know better. And charts are even better at causing bad information because what you're doing is you're taking a complex set of numbers and you're paring them down into a chart, a pie chart, a bar graph, and you're making something that could be complex, very simple. And anytime someone does that, there's a huge chance for error. Or sometimes they'll change the values along the different access ranges that are there. So for example, they may look and say, you get better results with drug A versus drug B. It's because the numbers they put on the chart are in decimals. And so it may only be a 0.3 better chance of you having a good result with the new drug versus the old drug, but their chart makes it look extreme because they're trying to give a good impression. We did great. And it may not be true. So also keep in mind that when you look at a chart, it should always start at zero. It should always have a decent value in the way it's going up. I want to make sure that anyone's cherry picking the value ranges are there to either make it look extreme or make it look less extreme. Someone who's trying to persuade you with a chart is doing so by cutting off the data ranges that are there. I went to this museum once and it was about a scientific aspect. And all the charts cut off at 1998, even though it was about a decade after that point. So I went home and I looked up the true data and that's because the data drastically changed after 1998 and no longer proved the point of the museum. So the museum was chopping off the data to make it look more favorable to the point they were trying to make. There was a very famous leukemia study where they had a drug that was for childhood leukemia and it looked incredibly promising. The people taking that new drug were doing well. And it looked like the leukemia was stopped. As soon as you got to that end point of the chart, people started failing on the drug. You know, that's the tricky thing with disease is sometimes it finds a way. If you had two people, one taking one drug and one taking the other drug, they pretty much progressed at the same time, even though the one chart looked more promising. The person who presented this data to the FDA eventually went to jail and losing his position and that research, all because he cherry-picked the range. Sometimes two people will try to make a chart look really spiffy with interesting graphics because they're trying to hide something that is interesting. So someone made this chart about most popular pet in America, and it had little cats and little dogs and everything else like that, but the clever way they drew the graph was lying about what the actual data was. It made it look like one answer was true, that dogs were more popular, but based on the way that they were drawing the cats, it was actually the cats that were more popular. When someone tries to make a chart look neat, sometimes they're trying to do something. Sometimes people mislabel the accesses. They, they mislabel exactly what is in those charts to try to either nullify what it's saying because they don't want people to understand it or because they're trying to make it more meaningful so that it proves what they're saying. But just keep in mind that sometimes what is put in as the chart information isn't exactly what was in that study or what was being even studied at all. The thing that people will do in order to make charts hard to read on purpose is they will make them so complex that no one knows what they mean at all. There's no way to tell exactly what the chart is saying. And so because people are reading the news and they're reading it very quickly, they'll just gloss over the whole thing. If something looks terribly complex, it may be either because the situation is very complex or someone's trying to hide the truth of the data. Sometimes people are doing that because they are trying to be awful with statistics and convince you of something. And other times it's because they don't really understand numbers themselves. 
a lot of times, particularly when you're talking about the press or television channels or print, the people who are making the charts don't understand statistics well themselves. That's just not what they went to school for. So when they're making a chart, they think they're doing an honest job of what they're trying to do. But in fact, the uh, chart or the graph is not very telling. And then the last thing to look for is in pie charts. Sometimes pie charts are not made up of 100%. So you may see something like you have five candidates, 10% like this person, 15% like this person. But if you add it up the whole pie chart, it only comes out to 65%. What happened to the other 35%? Is it that 35% of the people don't know who they want to vote for? Or did they vote for someone else and they don't want that person on the chart? So be careful, too, that anytime you see a chart that does not make up 100% in the pie chart, something's going on and you try to figure out what it is that's happening. There's a couple of things that we do that kind of wreck statistics. First of all, emotional stories will be a lot of times what the news goes to or people will go to when trying to explain something. But it may be that emotional story doesn't exactly represent what's going on or is not the way we can fix something. They'll say, oh, the price of college is because of this. And they'll give an example and then they'll talk to one person. Here's Sarah. Sarah tried to go to college. She wanted to go to college her whole life, but it was because she invested in the stock market, lost all her money, and so she couldn't go to college. Well, is that a story that's typical of why people can't go to college or can't afford college? Or is that an outlier for what it is? So an emotional story is interesting and heartfelt, and we hope for that person, but it doesn't always explain to us exactly what it is we need to fix in order to get that person fixed up or to have their situation never happen. And then there's something that's called availability heuristics, and this is where we interpret statistics wrongly. If we hear about something all the time, in our brain, we tend to think it happens more often. When you see all the lottery winners on TV and they're living this great life, it makes a huge impression on you. It makes you really think about what kind of life you would live if you won the lottery. Because of that huge impression, that emotion tied to it, and the fact that you tend to see more winners on TV than you see the people who spend money on the lottery every week never win a thing. Or... They win something, but it never goes to the level of where they make up the money they originally spent. That effect of making us think that there are more winners than losers just because of what we see on TV, what we hear about in books and stories, gives us the wrong impression and our brain weights it more heavily than it should. So availability heuristic just means that our brain tends to think whatever it hears more of is the more popular thing is the thing that happens more often, and that's where our risks are. My show notes have a couple of videos and a couple of articles in there that show you example of where statistics were used improperly. My goal in this was to really help you understand that statistics are something that's easy to manipulate, easy to try to get people to believe what you want them to believe. And you can defend against that by thinking out the stats, by reading a little bit more into the article or any sort of footnotes that are associated with a chart. And it usually only takes a quick minute to see when a statistic is something that's not reliable or a chart is trying to provide information that isn't representative of what it either says it is or that the data is worthwhile. Again, if we see a study that has too few people, if we see labeling issues, if we don't see all the results, and if we see exaggerated scales on any kind of chart or statistic we're read, those are all warning signs. Not only that, if we ever hear of a correlation, immediately we have to know that we cannot determine cause and effect. All we know is there's possibly a relationship, and I mean possibly. It may be the two events are completely unrelated, Or they have a confounding factor that ties the two together, but doesn't provide cause and effect. My challenge to you is to look for one correlation that you're told this week. Did the person who mentioned it try to infer that there was a cause and effect relationship between the two things? Or did they explain it properly? Can you figure out how the two things are related, are not related, 
or maybe have a confounding component to them where they're related, but one doesn't cause the other. See how many of those things happen to you every week. And now our fun entertainment advice of the week comes from the TV show Numbers. I've pinpointed the area most likely to be the perpetrator's residence. You got the guy's address? Not the address, no. An approximate base. In trying to avoid a pattern, you wound up with one anyway? Yep, locations purposefully distanced from a site not on your map, but clearly marked in the perpetrator's mind, namely his residence. The equation reveals the probability that each area has of being the subject's base. Yellow's the hot zone. I had a feeling about Silver Lake. I estimate an 87% chance he lives in that area. You know, I don't know a lot about mathematics, but this doesn't make any sense to me. It makes more sense than this. You can't win if you don't buy a ticket. Yes, this is truth. However, the odds of this one being the winning ticket are one in 41 million, which means if you bought 20 tickets every week, you would win the jackpot once every 40,000 years. Really? Yep. It's basic probability theory. And that's amazing. It was a fun show to watch, particularly if you love math. But even in that particular case, he was using correlation to determine where the murderer lived. And it could also be that that murderer worked in that area or visited a coffee shop in that area. Correlation can certainly help, but it's always the beginning of the story, never the end of the story. It never shows cause and effect until we can prove it otherwise. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. If you want to contact me, you can reach me at jill at smallstepspod.com. And I'm happy to either answer questions or talk about a topic that you're interested in listening to. Have a wonderful week.